So, the NVIDIA RTX 5080 is finally here. Keep this video in mind in June, when you might finally be able to buy one. Before we get into it, if you like the content you see here on Craft Computing and want to help support me in what I do, consider heading on over to craftcomputing.store and picking up some of our fantastic merch. We've got laser engraved nucleated pint glasses, whiskey stones, coasters, all of it made and designed 100% in-house by me. Thank you for the support and for helping keep the lights on around here. And now, onto the video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. To say the launch of NVIDIA's latest 5000 series graphics cards has been a mixed bag would be putting it mildly. Leading up to CES, there was a ton of hype around these next generation graphics cards, and the potential for yet another massive leap forward in performance, just like NVIDIA delivered with Ampere and Ada Lovelace cards over the last four years. But now that the dust has settled, the reviews are out, and the scalpers have cleaned out what little inventory there was, it's hard to put any kind of positive spin on this situation. I was incredibly excited for the release of the RTX 5090, simply from being a fan of technology and seeing the evolution of visuals that are happening in games right now. But I also consider myself to be a realist, and I know that the RTX 5090 is a luxury product priced at $2,000, and it shouldn't really be considered as a valid benchmark or point of comparison by just about anyone. The real next generation card that we should be paying attention to is the RTX 5080, and its new low price of $999. But the more I worked on this review, the more I could literally feel the enthusiasm leaving me in real time. And I really hated that sensation, because being excited about tech is why I've been in the tech industry for nearly 20 years. And what really sucks, from my point of view, I've worked nearly 100 hours over the last two weeks reviewing both the RTX 5090 and the RTX 5080. I am still a one-man shop, after all. I still am going to publish this review, even though by the time I'll be able to get it published, these GPUs will be long sold out, with stock replenishment not expected until at least late March for the RTX 5080, or possibly even later. I'm filming this on February 3rd, and by all accounts, not a single GPU is available at retail at this point. But there are about 100 listings for RTX 5090s and another 500 listings for RTX 5080s up on eBay, most of them at 2 to 300% markups. Just know, I hate this situation just as much as you do. With that said, on the desk today, I have the NVIDIA RTX 5080 Founders Edition card, which retails for $999. I've also got the latest from Zotac in the Zotac Solid OC RTX 5080, an absolute beast of a graphics card that's going to sell for $1,149. The extra $150 gets you a massive triple fan blow-through cooler and a very mild overclock over the Founders Edition, 2640 MHz on the boost clock versus 2617 MHz on the Founders card. I think the Zotac Solid OC cooler design is fantastic, with a bit of silver, gold, and gray making for a very classy looking combo. But it's also hard to look over at NVIDIA's first-party GPUs and not be a little bit disappointed seeing their return to slim two-slot cards. While gaming PCs have been relegated to a massive GPU with a motherboard that happens to be hanging off the back of it, most of my PCs still have secondary PCI Express slots, whether it's for high-speed networking, HDMI capture, or even just for additional USB connectivity. Large GPUs limit your expansion options for people who use their PCs for more than just gaming, which is why I have always laughed at professionally focused four slot cards. At three and a quarter slots thick, for argument's sake, let's just round that up to four since the fourth slot can't be used anyway, this card won't even fit into some micro ATX cases. And at CES, there were very few cards from NVIDIA partners that would. It was hard to find GPUs that were only two slots, even for the upcoming RTX 5070, let alone for the 5080 or the 5090. But maybe there is something to having a card with a larger cooler on it. Is the Zotac Solid OC a cooler running GPU with more performance headroom than the Founders RTX 5080? Is it worth the $150 premium? And for that matter, how's the overclocking on the Founders card to begin with? For starters, let's take a look at some synthetic benchmarks inside of 3DMark. The RTX 5080 Founders Edition manages a graphics score of 21,380 in Firestrike Ultra, which is actually a 19% improvement over the 4080 Super from the last generation. We see similar uplifts in Time Spy Extreme, with the 5080 coming in at around 14% faster than the 4080 Super here as well. 
Adding ray tracing to the mix, we see a nearly 21% jump between generations in Port Royal, with the 5080 outscoring the 4080 Super 22,429 to 18,582. And again, a nearly 19% generational leap in Speedway, with scores of 8977 to just 7549. Between the RTX 5080 and the RTX 4080 Super Founders Edition cards, we see an average improvement in performance of 17.8%, which feels wrong, if I'm being honest. See, because I hadn't quite completed my write-up before the January 30th embargo, I did get to see a couple other outlets' numbers before finishing up. Well, eTechnics shows just a 4.5% difference between the two cards at 1080p, just a 2% gain at 1440, and just shy of 9% at 4K. Other sites also showed similar lackluster results. My own gaming numbers are slightly better, sitting at somewhere between 7 and 10% at 1440p between the two cards. Part of the reason I took a couple extra days with this review was to pour over my own data, retest certain games and settings, and see if I could dial in why synthetic tests show a 14 to 21% improvement, and why those don't necessarily translate into gaming results. And unfortunately, there is no clear answer. We see around 17% better performance in synthetic tests, but my gaming results are closer to 10% on average. But I am getting slightly ahead of myself, as this was just the results from the RTX 5080 Founders card. What about the overclocking on the Zotac Solid OC? Out of the box, the Founders Edition managed a GPU clock speed of around 2725 MHz, while the Zotac was closer to 2850 MHz, or around 4.5% faster. Using Zotac's Firestorm utility, I was able to get a decent overclock, topping out at just over 3 GHz in games, or around 300 MHz higher than the Founders Edition RTX 5080. As for overclocking the Founders Edition card, well, it seems to be pretty well topped out already, as even trying for an extra 50 MHz on the GPU core resulted in some instability. In all, I saw around an 11% higher GPU clock speed on the Zotac Solid OC when overclocked, but that resulted in only around 5% better performance in both synthetic testing and gaming alike. Keep in mind that out-of-the-box performance was also nearly identical between these two cards, showing only around a 2% advantage on the Zotac Solid OC. Also of note, Zotac's Firestorm utility does have an automatic overclock scanner to help determine the best settings for your GPU. But when attempting to use it on the 5080 Solid OC, it seems to be completely non-functional. When you click on the scanner, it says it should take between 5 and 10 minutes to run, as it pushes your GPU through multiple frequency ranges to see where the limits are. But after less than 30 seconds, the scanner reports that a 0 MHz overclock is the perfect place for your GPU to be. Keep in mind that the 0 MHz overclock number is actually the base clock of the GPU, so 2.29 GHz, rather than the out-of-the-box boost speed of 2850, resulting in significantly lower performance if you indeed set the boost clock to 0 MHz. Now, I did get the scanner to run properly, kind of, at least one time, where it took nearly 50 minutes to complete, and then recommended a 130 MHz boost clock. Now, for reference, my manual setting was to increase the core voltage by 15 millivolts, increase the GPU power limit to 111%, and then run an 813 MHz overclock on the GPU core, increasing the GPU clock speed from its base of 2295 to a theoretical max of 3108. Again, in games, this settled out to be right around 3015 MHz, and closer to 2950 in synthetic tests. It's not much, but it does result in around a 5% performance bump over the Founders Edition card. And like I said, I couldn't even squeeze another 50 MHz out of the Founders. The Zotac Solid OC is faster, but 5% in games is hardly noticeable, regardless of what your expectations for a video card were going in. In my gaming benchmarks, there were still a couple surprising results though, like in Cyberpunk 2077, set to the Ultra preset, but without any ray tracing, path tracing, or DLSS enabled. We see the Zotac 5080 pull off a 19% improvement over the 4080 Super. Enabling path tracing at 1440p, again without DLSS, the game is far from playable at just 44 frames per second, but still around 12% faster than the 4080 Super. Enabling DLSS balance does even the cards back out, with the Zotac 5080 Solid OC taking just a 9% lead over the 4080 Super. And that result is much more in line with the rest of my testing, with games like Dragon Age Veilguard, Doom Eternal, Starfield, and Metro Exodus all clocking in at around 10% faster on the 5080 than the 4080 Super at 1440p and Ultra settings. 
On average, the seven games that I tested show the RTX 5080 Founders at roughly 10% faster than the 4080 Super at 1440p, but only 1% faster at 4K. The Zotac Solid OC does widen the gap significantly, coming in at nearly 16% faster than the 4080 Super at 1440p, and around 7% faster at 4K. It's still only 5% faster than the RTX 5080 Founders Edition card, while being 15% more expensive. But this is also the market that NVIDIA created when they started directly competing with their partner cards. But like I said, it's not like you're going to find one of these on the shelf over the next few months anyway. So which is the right RTX 5080 for you? The one that you're able to buy if you're in the market for one. Now eventually, these cards are going to be back in stock. So how should the RTX 5080 play into your buying decision? As disappointed as myself and a lot of other reviewers are about the lack of improvement, the bottom line for the RTX 5080 is it is still a step up from the RTX 4080 Super, and even more so from the RTX 4080. It's selling for the same price as the 4080 Super, and is coming in at $200 less than the launch price of the RTX 4080. The 5080 also has some major advantages for professionals, like 422 video decoding for those working with high bitrate videos. Overall, that's still a win for consumers, even if it's not as big of a win as most people were hoping for. So like I said, a bit of a mixed bag. It is definitely a step forward as far as the technology goes, and it is overall a better value than the RTX 4080 or the 4080 Super presented. But they're kind of unobtainable at this point, and it's not the leap forward that a lot of people were hoping for. But what do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts on the RTX 5080 down in the comments below. In the meantime, I'm planning on doing a couple videos looking at graphics cards you might have in your PCs right now, or that you can find at reasonable deals on the used market. Cards like the AMD 5700 XT, the Intel A770 and B580, the NVIDIA RTX 3060, and so on. Just to see how they actually stack up today, and if you're actually missing out by not having the latest and greatest GPU in your rig. Plus, it gives me an excuse to play some Kingdom Come Deliverance 2 for hours on end in the name of science. So, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that one. If you like this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description and gets you exclusive access to my Discord server. And that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Beer for today is one that I saw the label on and absolutely had to buy it right there on the spot. This is from Silver Falls Brewing in Silverton, Oregon. It is the Haze Ghost Coast to Coast, a hazy IPA clocking in at 7.2%. Haze Ghost Coast to Coast. I bought this strictly for the can. The can art is freaking fantastic. Um, I don't know if it's officially licensed, but some reason I doubt it. So I think this is my third time reviewing this beer, second time on camera. I did drink it on Talking Heads last week, and then I also opened one uh, during a voice chat with some of my Discord peeps. So this is my third crack at it. I, I really like this beer. This to me is what a lot of hazy IPAs were trying to be in that 2015 to 2018 range, but they never quite achieved it. This is a super punchy, citrusy, a little bit sweet, and a little bit dry on the back end, kind of kind of punch. Lots of hop flavor, lots of, of blood orange and guava. And while it is super thick and super citrusy and super acidic, I don't feel that burn, that acid burn in the back of my throat building. That was the downfall of so many New England and hazy style IPAs, uh, you know, eight to 10 years ago. They're delicious, but only four ounces at a time. And once you've had that, that's all you can taste for the rest of your mouth because it literally kills your taste buds and destroys the back of your throat. This has all of that phenomenal citrusy hop flavor without having you swallow razor blades at the same time. I really like this one.